ask unanimous consent that the chair be authorized to declare a recess at any time during today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. For members participating remotely, if a member is experiencing any connectivity issues or any other technical problems, please inform the committee staff as soon as possible so you can receive assistance. I'll make a good faith effort to provide every member experiencing any kind of connectivity issues will have an opportunity to participate fully in the proceedings. It's the responsibility of each member seeking recognition to unmute their microphone prior to speaking and to keep your microphone muted when not speaking to avoid inadvertent background noise. Should I hear any advertent background noise, dogs barking, cats meowing, children playing, uh, I'll request that the member please mute their microphone. And finally, to insert a document into the record, please have your staff email it to documentsTNI at mail.house.gov. We want to say good afternoon to everybody who is watching or participating and to thank our witnesses for being here today. This is the subcommittee's first hearing of the 117th Congress. Before we get started though, I'd like to take a minute to recognize and welcome Mr. Daniel Webster of Florida, who is the new ranking member of the subcommittee. Our subcommittee has the distinction of being the most productive of any of the subcommittees under transportation and infrastructure, and I look forward to working together with Mr. Webster to keep that record going as we advance policies and programs that safeguard the lives and livelihoods of the communities we serve. Today's hearing is entitled, Building Smarter, the Benefits of Investing in Resilience and Mitigation. These are two intertwined topics that have enjoyed bipartisan attention and cooperation in the past. The Federal Emergency Management Agency is perhaps responsible for the most significant amount of dedicated funding for pre and post disaster mitigation. And it leads the whole of federal government strategy to build a more resilient nation. Ranking member Webster is no stranger to these issues. As he noted to me, he previously worked in the Florida legislature to enact the state's updated building codes in 1996, following the devastating impacts of Hurricane Andrew. Those updated building codes are one example of a cost-effective mitigation strategy, and they've led to more resilient communities all across Florida. In insurance and emergency management circles, Florida's 2004 hurricane season is infamous for four major storms, Charlie, Francis, Ivan, and Jean, that crisscrossed the state during a six-week span, leaving virtually no square inch untouched. In the wake of those storms, the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety conducted a study of residential construction comparing homes built before and after the 1996 adoption of the bolstered codes to examine the impacts on insurance claims. The IBHS study found that homes constructed after the new codes saw 60% fewer claims, and those claims were 42% less costly than the homes constructed before the strengthened codes. Now, that's just one example. But we know that when homes, businesses, and other infrastructure are built stronger from the get-go or are built back stronger following disasters, they're less likely to be seriously damaged during future events. That ability to bounce back faster is a measure of their resilience. Unfortunately, as more American communities grapple with ever increasingly severe natural hazards, we don't have to look hard to find examples of communities that we all represent that have been knocked down by recent disasters. Last month, for example, Texas Electric Utilities suffered a multi-day catastrophic failure resulting from an unusual deep freeze. Something similar had happened in 2011 and also in 1989, and one of the recommendations of the multiple after-action reviews in 2011 was for generating companies to invest in insulation 
for equipment and heaters or other technology that's commonly employed by their counterparts in areas more prone to cold weather. While the power generators are typically investor-owned utilities and ineligible for mitigation assistance from FEMA, their failure to invest in this type of mitigation led Governor Abbott to request a major disaster declaration for all 254 Texas counties to provide relief to the four and a half million households that lost power and to the public buildings and other infrastructure deep damaged by the deep freeze. In a briefing for members of Congress and their staffs last month, the state's emergency manager, Chief Nim Kidd, estimated that the resulting damages experienced by public buildings, private businesses, and residents from last month's rolling blackouts from days-long power outages would likely result in the need for more federal disaster assistance, more than was allocated to respond and recover from 2018's Hurricane Harvey. And that was the state's costliest natural disaster up until that point. And it was reported on Tuesday that at least 57 Texans lost their lives as a result of severe winter weather from hypothermia, carbon monoxide poisoning, medical equipment failure, falls, and car crashes. We haven't even touched now on the ever-increasing threat of wildfires across the West and the expansive risk to low-lying communities from rising tides or storm surges. The majority of the assistance FEMA provides in response to presidential disaster declarations funds, decorations, funds the repair or replacement of infrastructure. In addition to this public assistance funding, the Stafford Act provides for 15% of eligible disaster costs to be sent to disaster impact states to be used in post-disaster mitigation projects. This is referred to as the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. These projects have provided a significant return on investment to the taxpayer. Depending on the type of project, the National Institute of Building Sciences has demonstrated between $4 and $11 in reduced disaster recovery costs resulting from federally funded mitigation projects. Let me repeat that, a savings of between, or return between $4 and $11 depending on the project. And that's a key point for us to remember. In 2018, following significant analysis work by this subcommittee, Congress amended the Stafford Act with the passage of the Disaster Recovery Reform Act. For the first time, taking lessons learned from successful post-disaster mitigation programs, we decided that FEMA should have a similarly funded program. This program existed prior to the reform bill, but was cons consistently funded by our colleagues in appropriations. Uh, we thought we needed to take a closer look at this and found that the program should differ from the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program because it would be nationally competitive. <clears throat> For a state like Nevada, that can make a huge difference. We have 86% of, of our land owned by the federal government, so we don't get much disaster relief, so pre-disaster mitigation would be a game changer. FEMA's program is called BRIC, Building Resilient Infrastructure and Community. It's too soon to tell how effective BRIC is, but just to look at the figures, the first application cycle for $500 million through applications totaling $3.6 billion. So obviously, there's a great demand. So we want to examine what works and what's flawed in FEMA's approach to mitigation and resilience, how the agency can further empower states, tribes, territories, and localities to better leverage this type of program. I look forward to all of our witnesses and our members' perspectives, working with Ranking Member Webster and our colleagues to advance future legislative efforts out of this committee to provide FEMA the resources and tools that it needs to make American communities more resilient, more resistant to predictable hazards. I thank you for your attention. And I now recognize Ranking Member Webster for his opening remarks.
I ask unanimous consent to, before you begin, Mr. Webster, if you'll indulge me, unanimous consent to insert two items into the record. One is a statement from Bill Strong Coalition, which has been a leader on these issues. I believe a few of our witnesses today are actually members of Bill Strong. And also the committee's received a letter from the Smarter, Safer Coalition outlining its priorities in this space. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Webster. Thank you, Chair Titus, for uh, holding this uh, hearing today. I really appreciate it. I thankful for the witnesses, including Mr. Uh, Falk, who is from Florida, representing the National Association of Home Builders. I'm pleased to serve as ranking member of the subcommittee. I look forward to working closely with the chair uh, on issues critical to this subcommittee, including resiliency and mitigation, which are very important to Florida. So in 2015, Work was done in this committee, and we learned that just 25% of the disasters accounted for more than 92% of the disaster costs. While disaster declarations have increased, these numbers show it is a small number of large disasters that are driving the disaster costs. Ultimately, the real solution to lowering disaster costs is upfront investment in mitigation, which the chair talked about, hardening of uh, of existing structures, which is sometimes very economical and yet brings about much savings, not only the savings, but also strength to the building. Uh, we know mitigation saves lives, reduces property damage, and uh, disaster costs. Study after study shows, as the chairman said, that the invested dollar uh, mitigation, you get four to eleven dollars are saved. We have seen uh, the benefits of mitigation firsthand in Florida. Uh, after a devastating 2004-2005 hurricane season, Florida made specific policies uh, and behavior changes to improve on our disaster preparedness, including uh, uh, an overhaul which began quite a few years ago uh, before that to uh, rewrite the building code and, and implement it. The cornerstone of these changes was uh, mitigation through uh, resilient construction techniques and improve communication and coordination between the state and local agencies. Florida worked with the industry leaders, home builders, insurance uh, industry, and other stakeholders on a regional basis approach, recognizing that a one-size-fits-all uh, does not really work, uh, and leveraging incentive groups and other avenues to help manage costs to consumers. These investments in mitigation help to protect Florida communities against hurricanes, flooding, and other, other hazards. Uh, whether it's hurricanes, floods, or wildfires, ensuring the investments <clears throat> make sense and are cost efficient is important to in, ensuring the effectiveness of that. I look forward to hearing from the rest of the witnesses and uh, today, and uh, this is an important topic. Thank you, Chair Titus, for holding this hearing, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Webster. Before recognizing our witnesses, I would ask uh, for Mr. DeFazio, the Chairman of Transportation and Infrastructure, his opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, FEMA has been busy. Uh, it was quite a year, uh, pandemic, uh, above average tornado, flood, hurricane, and wildfires. Uh, in the United States. And I've got to thank uh, the people at FEMA. Uh, there were a lot of parts of the last administration that became pretty dysfunctional. Uh, FEMA did not, uh, and they were able to deliver. Uh, and I appreciate all the people who engaged in, in that hard work. Um, you know, the uh, building uh, resilient infrastructure uh, and communities uh, the BRIC program, as you call it, is uh, totally oversubscribed. The demand is phenomenal. The savings are even more extraordinary and phenomenal, in addition to ongoing savings for the, uh, the individuals, communities, businesses, uh, in terms of reduced insurance costs uh, when they undertake these, uh, these uh, activities. In October, I led a bipartisan letter with Ranking Member Graves, Chair Titus, and then uh, Ranking Member Katko, FEMA Administrator Gaynor and uh, OMB Director Vought, 
uh, urging them to set aside the full 3.7 billion uh, of brick uh, for COVID. Uh, unfortunately, they ignored that and they set aside only $500 million. I'm hopeful that that can soon be corrected uh, by this uh, administration. Uh, and also, uh, when we did the DRRA, uh, the Disaster Recovery Resilience Act, uh, I think that was the last Congress, or the Congress before, I can't remember anymore. Um, you know, we uh, uh, established post-disaster uh, hazard mitigation uh, grant programs uh, for uh, FEMA for fire uh, management assistance. Uh, and I, I think there are activities that uh, need to be uh, expanded and considered under under that program. Uh, for example, uh, you know, you probably can't move an entire community out of the wildland urban interface when it comes to fires. Uh, but uh, in the case of Blue River, my district, the fire was started by uh, a uh, fire that fell from a pole with a severe and absolutely unprecedented, unusual wind out of the Northeast, which doesn't happen, but hey, a lot of weird things happen these days. And, uh, you know, so uh, considering to put uh, the utilities underground, it's, yeah, it's an additional cost, but it's a one-time cost. Uh, you're not gonna have to put back the poles again, or maybe put back the poles and start another fire again, and then go back and put the poles back up, et cetera. So, uh, I, I think that we need to expand uh, our view of what kinds of activities, uh, you know, will be, uh, you know, will be acceptable. And, and I don't believe all this investment has to be borne directly by the federal government. Uh, going all the way back to 113th Congress, I worked with uh, Representatives Reed, uh, Pascrell, and diaz Ballard to introduce the Disaster Savings and Resilient Construction Act, uh, which we will reintroduce. Uh, it provides tax incentives to encourage individuals, companies uh, to uh, basically prepare their homes and businesses uh, to uh, their whatever is the predicted natural disaster uh, and known risks in their areas, uh, lessens the cost of insurance uh, claims and certainly a future disaster relief. Uh, and I plan on working with our colleagues on the Ways, Committee, Ways and Means Committee and hopefully they will advance the measure. Uh, and then, uh, you know, just three years ago, uh, the uh, Republican-controlled Congress and White House decided that DOD had to establish a resilience standard for all its at-risk uh, uh, facilities. Uh, and they all had to be, uh, everything critical had to be a minimum of two feet above base uh, flood level elevation. Uh, so. Uh, if it's good enough when the federal government invests money uh, in the Pentagon and its bases, I think uh, it should be for all federally funded infrastructure. And we'll be looking in our surface bill to build back uh, resilient. Uh, and then uh, during our February markup, uh, my friend from Louisiana, uh, Representative Garrett Graves, offered an amendment to set aside 500 million of the 50 billion we gave to FEMA disaster relief to be used to establish a national flood standard. I'm certainly open to working with him in pursuing one. Our colleagues, uh, Mr. Price of North Carolina and Mr. Zeldin of New York have recently introduced legislation with a similar goal, which has been referred to the committee. So uh, we've got our work cut out for us uh, to uh, you know, go forward in uh, a bipartisan way uh, to work and help uh, give FEMA the tools and uh, the capability and the flexibility it needs to meet with uh, uh, new and evolving uh, risks. Um, and you know, BRIC is just one example of uh, how quickly uh, we could make these investments uh, with the oversubscription of that program. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I yield back to balance my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Graves is not with us to make a statement, so we'll now like to welcome the witnesses to our panel. Uh, Mr. Roy Wright, who is President and CEO of Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. Ms. Velma Smith, Senior Government Relations Officer for the Pew Charitable Trust. Mr. Ben Harper, Head of Corporate Sustainability, Zurich, North America. Mr. John Falk, would you like to say something about him, Mr. Webster? Yeah. Mention anything about Mr. Falk? Didn't you say he was from Florida? Well, he's a, he was a national senior for home safety. Yeah. 
national chairman of the home builders and uh, but he also is from florida a builder over in the tampa area tampa bay area all right we're glad to have him and then uh mr russell strickland i believe ms norton would like to introduce him Yes, Madam Chair, I, I, I will be pleased to introduce today as a witness, Mr. Russell J. Strickland from my neighboring state of Maryland. Mr. Strickland is an experienced emergency management professional who has more than 40 years of experience in the field of emergency services and first responder activities at the state and local levels of government, academia, and the private sector. This includes expertise in fire and rescue services emergency medical services, fire inspection and investigation, communications and emergency management leadership. Mr. Strickland currently serves as the executive director of the American, of the Maryland Emergency Management Agency. In his current role, Mr. Strickland leads the agency that has primary responsibility and authority for disaster risk reduction and consequent management for the state of Maryland. This includes service uh, as a direct advisor to the governor during disasters and coordinating support for local government as requested. With this extensive background, I am pleased uh, th that we have Mr. Strickland here to testify before us this afternoon, and I thank you, Mr. Strickland, and you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Norton. You. Uh, we're delighted to have all our witnesses. They certainly bring a level of professionalism and expertise to the panel, and we look forward to hearing from them. Without objection, our witnesses' full statements will be included in the record. Since your written testimony has been made a part of the record, the subcommittee requests that you limit your oral testimony to five minutes. We'll now proceed with the witnesses and begin with Mr. Strickland. Thank you for the kind introduction and for holding this hearing and allowing me to testify on behalf of the National Emergency Managers Association. In the state of Maryland, we rely on investments in mitigation and a whole community approach to addressing our vulnerabilities. These investments ensure that when a disaster strikes, the communities affected will be able to effectively respond and build back stronger. However, our journey to be a more resilient state and nation faces some challenges that with your permission, I would like to address. First, your foresight in creating the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, BRIC, has allowed states to implement projects that will strengthen our collective resilience for the long term. However, state and local needs currently far exceed available funding. As such, we strongly encourage Congress to work with FEMA and OMB to allow the full 6% set aside of eligible disaster spending every year for this program. BRIC is transformative in its capacity to support large infrastructure projects, particularly those related to stabilizing community lifelines, and that is why it is so important. Further, building resilience for Maryland's energy and communications lifelines is central to supporting our communities as they try to return to normal operations after a disaster. Given that in many states, the private sector owns and operates most critical infrastructure, leveraging BRIC funding with public-private partnerships will strengthen our resilience. The federal government remains an active partner in supporting our mitigation projects and strengthening our resilience. Earlier this year, Maryland submitted an application to the BRIC program, and we're looking forward to getting started. Second, FEMA's all or nothing approach to building code standards in this year's BRIC application scoring may unfairly place communities that are still working through that adoption process at a disadvantage, perpetuating a cycle that puts people and buildings at risk. In my written statement, I go into detail about the benefits provided by using building codes that are appropriate to local hazards to avoid disaster losses and increase resilience. While these benefits are a worthwhile investment, states often must conduct a lengthy legislative process to adopt new building codes. FEMA should remain flexible in supporting states and locals as they work to adopt the building codes appropriate 
to their risk profiles. Another challenge in our efforts to build back stronger is the complexity of many FEMA grant programs and the extensive requirements a jurisdiction must satisfy to access FEMA funding. For example, one difficulty is assisting the many locals who do not have sufficient staffing and capacity to develop successful grant applications. This is particularly challenging for our low and moderate income communities that face repetitive hazard risk. We should work together to simplify the requirements or provide increased funding to hire staff to assist local jurisdictions in writing competitive grants. With disasters increasing in size and frequency, our recovery and resilience efforts must be aligned with building back stronger rather than the previous capability and capacity. As you know, the, Mar the state of Maryland is threatened by a host of hazards and a coastline vulnerable to sea level rise and erosion. In addition to our work with federal partners, Maryland is working to establish cross-sector partnerships that reduce risk to our people, property, and critical infrastructure. Effective coordination is critical, and Maryland has seen successful partnerships with FEMA through hazard mitigation assistance and our hosting of a FEMA integration team, which places FEMA personnel in a state emergency operations center. None of these cha challenges, however, cannot be overcome. Our strong working relationship with this, com this committee has brought us this far, and I'm sure will bring more opportunities for success in the future. On behalf of the state emergency managers, Thank you again for holding this hearing and drawing attention to the needs of the emergency management community. Emergency management is a team sport and we will surely be more successful in saving lives and property when we work together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Strickland. Mr. Wright. Good afternoon, Chair Titus, Ranking Member Webster and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you all today. If 2020 has taught us anything, it is that the home is of paramount importance and for too many vulnerable to the forces of mother nature. The, the dangers of COVID-19 led Americans to seek refuge in their homes, juggling remote work, childcare, and other necessities of life under a single roof. 2020 showed us that housing is infrastructure. Yeah, housing is infrastructure. And yet 2020 should also be remembered as the year that climate changed, barged through the front door of American families. 2020 delivered the most active Atlantic hurricane season on record, the most named storms in history, the outlandish number of acres that were burned by wildfire and a Midwest derecho that was the costliest thunderstorm in our nation's history. NOAA reported another 2020 record there were 22 weather and climate disasters that broke through the $1 billion cost mark. We'll look at 2020 in a broader context. While natural perils last year were particularly bad, it was not an anomaly. There's a pattern of major disasters that just won't let up. Lots of factoids. So what do we do about it? We must adapt and adapt now. In an era where severe weather continues to disrupt lives, displace families, and drive financial loss, our team at the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety develops the science and building practices so that the places where people live, learn, work, worship, and gather are safe, stable, and strong. The risk is on an escalating path. Our partners, uh, the Reinsurance Association of America, has been leveraging private sector analytics and public data to visualize the interplay between natural hazards, housing stock, and socioeconomic vulnerabilities. I'll let you look at the specifics in my written testimony, but here's the central point. We must leverage public-private partnerships if we're going to focus limited resources on the places of greatest impact. As IBHS studies wind, rain, hail, and wildfire, we see specific and actionable pathways that will bend down these risk curves. But we cannot allow resilience to be a luxury item. 
home and community resilience cannot be the exclusive option of the top two core tiles of income in this country. So some congressional pathways for strengthening the resilience of American homes. First, encourage strong statewide building codes. As you contemplate legislation, target those investments at places where we can spur new and sustained commitments by states to using modernized codes. We need the total investment to grow, not just switch out local dollars and replace them with federal grants. For those Americans who have the means to take actions, we need to nudge them to do so with resiliency tax credits like the um, bipartisan bill uh, that Chairman DeFazio mentioned. And where the pathway to home resilience is not readily affordable, we need to use national and state policy mechanisms to achieve our goal. The BRIC program could be better calibrated to fund residential resilience projects. What would it like, look like if we had created community disaster resilience zones, a, a derivation of the Build America bonds that drove private sector funding to address natural disaster risk of exposed communities, particularly focusing on underserved socioeconomic areas? Next, we need to prioritize resilient infrastructure. Uh, the cascading disaster in Texas last month put a clear spotlight on something we've known but have long ignored. The resilience of homes is intrinsically connected to the resilience of community infrastructure, especially water and energy. As Congress works with the Biden administration to develop an ambitious infrastructure bill, we urge this subcommittee to champion resilience and climate change adaptation as central objectives of that legislation. Do not miss the opportunity to reduce the future cost of disaster relief by making resilience to severe weather and changing climate a central component of the infrastructure. We need to extend this to public buildings. You all know this quite well with category E under the Stafford Act. Stop incentivizing communities to skip insurance because they know FEMA will simply pay the bill. In closing, Americans are not powerless against severe weather. It is possible to reduce the damage inflicted today and into the future. Meeting this pressing need will require an all of the above approach. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Wright. I like your comment, climate change barged through the front door of American families. I may have it to did. use that, but I promise I'll footnote you if I do. Uh, well, it's now all yours. <laughs> Thank you. Well, now I go to Ms. Smith. Thank you, Chairwoman Titus, uh, members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you on behalf of the Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, this afternoon, I'd like to just underscore a few of the points from my written testimony. And as others have noted, bottom line is we're losing the battle with extreme weather. Uh, the couple of points to, to note, the Congressional Budget Office has warned of an estimated average cost to the federal government of at least uh, $17 billion every year that 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 cost only for losses associated with hurricane winds and storm related flooding. Presidential disaster declarations since 2000, we totaled up the uh, obligated amounts for repairing or rebuilding utilities, public buildings, water and wastewater facilities and other assets, excluding emergency work. We're talking $67 billion. But as others have said, we can do better because disaster, pre-disaster mitigation pays. The National Institutes of Building Sciences, as, as the chair and the ranking member have noted, give us the figures of how much we could be saving for every dollar spent. But even as we slowly work our way to correct the problems with buildings and infrastructure at risk today, we fear that we add to the problem with new investments that don't have ample protections. This sort of short-sighted spending should stop and it can. There are already important instances of resilience investment that show us what can be gained and what is possible. Take the case of the Texas Medical Center, devastated by Hurricane Allison, but restored with resilient features to be strong enough to withstand the ravages of Harvey. Or the Spalding Rehab Hospital built to serve a waterfront community in Boston, but built to func continue functioning as sea levels rise. 
consider the innovation and the no regrets adaptation solutions that architects, planners, engineers are designing restored rather than filled wetlands that keep homes from flooding and keep and stop sewage overflows. Oyster reefs protecting roadways, rail line piers that can be elevated as needed, rising, uh, rising along with the sea. Levees set back from rivers that redirect floodwaters and restore habitat. Many resiliency solutions will bring multiple benefits, keep businesses open, and supply lines functioning, offer employment, bring open space to harsh environments and address those painful social inequities. Some use nature itself to bring down the cost. It is perplexing then that such approaches have not been deployed more widely, that more communities, more developers and more public and private investors have not completed thorough forward-looking vulnerability assessments made siting, sensible siting choices and embraced modern building codes. That is why we believe that you must act swiftly in your infrastructure work to address this growing resilience gap. You will require, we are hopeful that you will require new investments in transportation to incorporate resilience, new invest authorizations for water infrastructure to, to require assessment of vulnerabilities and getting ready for weather extremes and assuring that new funding, federal funding for housing projects with federal funds, choose not the low lying risky land because it is cheap, but incorporate proven means of keep, keeping people high and dry and safe. As Chairman DeFazio has noted, this has been done before in the NDAA and you can do it again. We certainly call your attention to the HR 481, the Taxpayer Savings, the Flood Resiliency and Taxpayer Savings Act uh, introduced by Congressman Price and Zeldin. We think that is worth your, your swift action. In closing, I thank the chair for taking up this important issue and for inviting Pew to engage in this discussion. I look forward to your question. Thank you very much, Ms. Smith. Uh, Mr. Harper. Yes, good afternoon. I would like to thank Chairwoman Titus, Ranking Member Webster, and other members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Ben Harper, and I'm the head of corporate sustainability at Zurich North America. I'm a civil engineer by training and sit on, on the sustainability advisory committees for the American Society of Civil Engineers, the National Academy of Sciences uh, Transportation Research Board, the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety and others. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the critical importance of investing in resiliency and mitigation as we seek to reduce loss from disasters and speed individual and community recovery. Zurich North America is part of Zurich Insurance Group, a leading multi-line insurer that has been serving its customers in global and local markets for over 150 years. Our role as a global insurer provides for a unique perspective as to the required response and on urgency of the need to respond. My testimony is focused on the importance of physical resistance from natural hazards, but as risk managers, we fully recognize the interconnected nature of risk. Using our core risk assessment skills to respond to some of the most significant long-term societal and environmental trends, we have identified climate change as perhaps the most complex risk facing society today. It is intergenerational, it is international, and it is interdependent. Our aim at Zurich is to leverage our sector's role as a primary risk signaler for society to help raise awareness of the increasing frequency and intensity of natural hazard events, and ultimately to incentivize the behaviors and best practices that will be required to both mitigate the worst impacts and adapt to changing weather patterns. We do this because Zurich's mission is to protect individuals, businesses, and communities, and simply because it's the right thing to do. Furthermore, from an industry perspective, we do this because the impact of extreme weather events is escalating. And without enhancing resiliency and mitigation measures, many assets may simply become uninsurable. The property casualty industry has a tradition of being at the forefront of disaster mitigation. For example, in the late 1800s, several historic fires consumed vast areas of our largest cities, including New York, Chicago, and San Francisco. 
recognizing that the new normal of tightly packed, dense construction greatly elevated fire hazard. The insurance industry sounded the alarm for adding sprinklers, fire breaks in construction, and other mitigation techniques as a necessity to maintaining community continuity. The industry was forced to send risk-based price signals, which is a technical way of saying insurance will be prohibitively expensive or simply unavailable in some cases if you do not adapt to these practices. Given the trends that are occurring and the frequency and severity of weather events, we are again sounding this alarm. Investing in mitigation measures, including resilient infrastructure, nature-based solutions, and low-carbon technologies is required if society is to continue to operate with the continuity and resiliency that is expected. It is encouraging, however, that these changes require minimal investment in comparison to the benefits received. The 2019 analysis of the benefits of building resiliency into infrastructure systems in developing countries suggests that the extra cost of building resistance into these systems is only 3% of overall investment needs. However, when taken into account, both the capital costs and operating costs of the asset, in most cases, the total life cycle cost will be lower in a hardened, resilient structure. In our own post-event studies, conducted after significant flood, drought, and wildfire events, our analysis shows that every $1 spent on resiliency up front resulted in $5 savings in post-disaster. Like the integration of fire safety and modern construction, the necessity of which is unquestioned today, so should be inclusion of resiliency in building and infrastructure. Earlier in this testimony, I noted the concept of interconnected risk. This is a fundamental concept in risk management, which is directly applicable when managing physical risk as we've been discussing. For example, if we provide business interruption insurance for a casino operating on the Mississippi coast, which is built to, with hardened, resilient components, we need to also consider the supporting infrastructure that can have a direct impact to that insured. In this example, the value of the resilient building is limited if the casino is fully capable of operating after a major weather impact, but the roadways leading to the facility are damaged and impassable. This is just one example of why it is fundamental to consider the supporting infrastructure when building a complete, resilient environment. I also note the urgency in addressing these issues. Just two weeks ago, the American Society of Civil Engineers published their 2021 America's Infrastructure Scorecard, which gave the U.S.'s infrastructure an overall grade of C-, minus, which sadly is an improvement from the, from the previous score of a D+. Plus. Simply put, we are at a crossroads with regards to aging structures, and combined with a significant increase in severe weather events, we can no longer afford to deploy temporary Band-Aid fixes. And without proper resiliency standards as an integral part of all vertical and horizontal construction, we will simply be in the same situation we are facing today with increased perils without proper preparedness and all at a significant cost. Thank you, and I look forward to some of the questions. Thank you, Mr. Harper. Mr. Folk? Thank you. Chairwoman Titus, Ranking Member Webster, members of the committee, I am pleased to appear before you today on behalf of the National Association of Home Builders. I would like to discuss the importance of housing affordability, the role that modern building codes play in reducing damage from natural disasters, and the need for mitigation policies and programs to improve the resiliency of the existing housing stock. I also want to focus on suggest, suggested financing mechanisms and other incentives to spur investment of production of homes that are both resilient and affordable. My name is Chuck Falk. I am the National Association of Home Builders Chairman of the Board, and I'm a custom home builder in the Tampa Bay area. I have served on the City of Tampa and the State of Florida Hurricane Codes Committees, which gave me a firsthand look at what catastrophic disasters can do to communities. The unusual number of significant disasters over the past several years has been sobering, igniting a nationwide dialogue about risk, resiliency, and mitigation. NEHB has been actively engaged in these discussions, and we have been a longtime leader in the drive to make homes more resilient. To do so, we have repeatedly dis demonstrated commitment to sound federal disaster and floodplain management policies and cost-effective market-driven resiliency solutions that maintain housing affordability while balancing the needs of growing communities. Housing affordability is a real concern for many consumers, 
It is a 10 year low for single family market. Almost a third of nation's households pay more than 30% of their income for housing. NEHB estimates if the median US new home price goes up by $1,000, more than 150,000 American households will be priced out and no longer able to afford the American dream. Recognizing this crisis, Congress must factor in housing affordability when looking at solutions to build more resilient communities. Numerous proposals from legislators and stakeholders have suggested that mandates and more stringent building codes, such as the use of the latest published codes, are the answers to improving residential resiliency. We strongly disagree. Many of the code provisions are too prescriptive, too costly, and would be do very little to improve resilience. That's because homes built to modern post-2000 building codes are resilient and making significant updates are unnecessary. Evidence from FEMA and others support the fact and demonstrate that modern building codes have been very effective in preventing the destruction of homes due to various storms, fires, and earthquakes. For example, after the 2018 hurricane in Mexico Beach, Florida, studies showed that homes built post-2000 remained standing, while older homes did not. It is imperative that Congress recognize the importance of defining the latest published building code as one of the two most recently published editions of codes. This definition is essential as it provides states with the flexibility they need to follow their own code adoption, implementation, and enforcement processes while remaining eligible for federal funds and other assistance. It is also important for state and local governments to be able to tailor building codes and amend them as necessary to fit the needs of their communities and protect their citizens. Modern codes are intended to be flexible. What is best for Nevada is not best for Florida. Another important factor in, in the resiliency discussion is the role of existing housing stock. 98 million homes out of the nation's 124 million homes were built before 2000. This older housing stock was not subject to the modern building codes that are now in effect. It is imperative that Congress focus on improving the older homes, structures and infrastructure that are less resilient to natural disasters. Federal incentives, tax credits, grants, and other assistance programs would go a long way to facilitate and help fund the upgrades needed to ensure our homes and communities are ready for the future. These practical solutions will also ensure that working families have access to safe, decent, and affordable housing. In conclusion, we urge Congress to take a practical approach when seeking to mitigate the effects of future natural disasters. Relying on existing building codes, heeding the expertise of state and local governments, Focusing on improving existing housing stock and providing incentives is the best way to encourage greater resiliency in the nation's housing stock. This will also preserve housing affordability for new and existing homes. Thank you for the opportunity today to testify before you. Thank you very much. And I apologize, it's Mr. Falk, not Mr. Polk. So thank you for being okay. with us. That's okay. <laughs> I now ask unanimous consent that members not on the subcommittee be permitted to sit with the subcommittee at today's hearing and ask questions. Without objection, so ordered. I'd now like to recognize members of the committee for questions. Each member will be recognized for five minutes of questions, and I'll start by recognizing uh, Chairman DeFazio. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to go first. Um, just to um, any members of the panel, we're, we're looking at uh, major investments in water infrastructure, uh, both uh, wastewater and drinking water in uh, the infrastructure package upcoming uh, in the next couple of months. Um, I found in my district that uh, plastic uh, melts uh, in severe fires, and obviously then you have issues with seismic that could relate to other substances. Uh, what do you what do you think is I mean how how are we going to deal with this I, I I think maybe the last witness was talking about sort of localities I guess you would assess what your risks are what your biggest concern is and then try and attempt to rebuild the infrastructure in a way that deals with that. Anybody yes, Mr. Chairman, if I could, I I, I, I would tell you that that's exactly the right case. You've got to. Um, 
deal, particularly on this infrastructure side, but on the housing stock as well, um, specifically with the risk as it exists in that community. So you think about how things uh, tie together, you think about the pipes, but I also think about water infrastructure uh, and whether or not the infrastructure itself can withstand a major storm, a major storm surge event or uh, a fire that approaches it. You know, things like a flood risk management standard is so imperative because if water comes up and over into a wastewater treatment plant, it shuts down. I would add, Mr. Chairman, that the important thing is also to look at the risk as it will exist in the future. You don't want to have to rebuy uh, a new infrastructure. You don't want to have to rebuild the housing again. So you want to look to the extent that you can, you know, what what where's going to be the saltwater intrusion that could affect uh, the placement of new water supplies, where, where should the uh, pumps be placed, all sorts of things. Uh, the wastewater uh, facilities. How can you keep? How can you keep the electricity running when you are um, when you're flooded? So to look at future risk as well as current. Um, thank you. Um, and then I, I guess probably uh, uh, to Mr. Folk uh, or others can answer. But you raise concerns about the potential for a $1,000 increase in cost. Yet I was just talking to uh, Mr. Garamundi who had to leave and he was the insurance commissioner for a number of years in California. And I was talking about how I had uh, seen a photo after a Chaparral fire of a neighborhood where everything was toast except for one house. And that house was built with concrete siding, a tile roof and metal shutters and blocked uh, attic vents. And it was still standing, but I'm, I'm willing to bet that uh, current building codes don't require that, and it probably costs a lot more than $1,000 to get to that point. So do you think like with this building in Chaparral areas and other things as LA expands, uh, you know, that, that the, the modern building code uh, will take care of that, I, which would be probably uh, asphalt roof, uh, certainly wouldn't include shutters uh, and, and other things? Well, I believe that codes, should be flexible where they can change in nature to where uh, issues uh, take place throughout different regions in the country. Um, you know, to, to replace, uh, to make houses to where uh, they meet and exceed uh, some of the things that you're mentioning here. If, uh, if they're made, uh, if they're not affordable, I don't think the consumer will ever have the opportunity to enjoy or appreciate the savings or the use of that facility. Well, the point being that if someone's doing a major new development and they are building it in such a way that in a Chaparral area, it's likely to burn down, um, that's gonna impose considerable costs, uh, obviously on the individuals and on the insurance and potentially on Stafford. So, um, you know, there's kind of front end cost, back end cost on these things. And I think there has to be a balance uh, and it should be, it seems to me dictated uh, by the region and the risk uh, and not say, well, we've got a uniform national building code and it, you know, houses are bolted down now, they don't fly off the foundation, blah, 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 we're taking care of these things. Uh, I, I think it needs to be more regionalized and localized. So uh, perhaps well, insur insurance uh, would like to uh, perhaps, or someone else uh, respond okay. to that. Sure. Thank you for the question. Um, I would I would echo your comments that um, well you know there's a national building code and there's a need for for regional codes as well. Uh, you know, natural disasters um, are, there, there's uniqueness to to different geographical areas. Uh, and and when you use the example of wildfire, you know that's one of those where I think it's it's almost a combination of what can you do from a regional perspective with codes and then what can you do also from a larger built environment perspective? How can we use public lands and parks to create buffer zones? How does zoning can, can be used to, to, to reduce exposure by mandating clustering of the built environment, um, creating defensible space and ensuring transportation networks are interconnected? So, you know, codes can be used to influence building styles, building materials, and landscapes. So I think there are several tools in the toolbox, but I would agree that there is, is 
very unique regional components to to what we're trying to do here. Um, but I think we also have to look at at, at all our possible tools that we have, um, in, including this the built environment in which that structure is sitting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Webster. I would say that, uh, first of all, Mr. Falk, uh, you raised some important issues on affordability in your testimony. Uh, we can push stronger building codes, however, if those building codes cost too much money, then the homeowners can't afford them and we haven't improved mitigation. So uh, where's the real balance between those two? I mean, there, there has to be a balance and, and I'm certainly I know in Florida there are places where we balance that out. Uh, what do you think? Well, uh, Ranking Member Webster, um, I think Florida is a perfect example of balance. Uh, after Hurricane Andrew, uh, I was able to witness firsthand the destruction that took place. Uh, it was devastating. It was it was almost hard to imagine uh, the damage that took place. The knee-jerk reaction was to build homes that were bulletproof and uh, could withstand uh, any kind of storm. But we learned very quickly that affordability was out the window then. You could not, uh, the consumer could not afford the home. It was very unattractive. And uh, so we looked for balance and we worked real hard in research and development through Hurricane, after Hurricane Andrew and uh, Mexico Beach, Florida. Uh, at the last hurricane in 2018 was a great example where older homes did not stand. The newer homes that were built post 2000 stood up against the storm and uh, it was a success story. Um, we, we learned a lot about Hurricane Andrew and, and the research that took place there and, and the practices that have happened afterwards have been a success story in Florida. But like I said earlier as well, what we do in Florida uh, is not necessarily what they need to do in Nevada. And therefore, uh, the codes need, need to be uh, flexible uh, throughout the country in different regions. One size doesn't fit all. How can we support homeowners with existing homes uh, in uh, improving their resiliency and uh, at their properties? Well, there, there, if funding was available for existing homes, uh, I think it, uh, there's, there's uh, the commerce is out there where, where companies will come in and bring your house up to current codes. Uh, and, uh, you know, things that we learned that were very simple were, were application of windows, uh, strapping of the trusses on the, on, the, on the building and installation and application of uh, the exterior doors and garage doors. Uh, some of these, uh, items here that I just mentioned would be very cost effective and add value to the home and also add safety to the homeowner. So can you tell about your work in Florida for which you were typically used as a model for building codes and mitigation and how flexibility to address those problems and uh, between affordability and the flexibility? Um, can you describe how you worked on that and your activities and planning? Well, we, we looked at first uh, the failure of the homes in Hurricane Andrew when Hurricane Andrew happened. Um, and there from there, uh, we looked at uh, solutions and uh, we learned uh, quickly that, that, you know, if the roof trusses uh, were to lift, the exterior wall would collapse. Therefore, the entire structure would collapse. So we started out with strapping down the trusses uh, putting more rebar and concrete in exterior walls and beefing up the exterior walls. In velocity zones, uh, we made sure that we had um, velocity uh, type windows, uh, impact windows. And in the installation of windows throughout the state, uh, we used more stringent application for installing the windows so that they weren't uh, easily uh, removed from uh, high winds. And, um, but another thing in Florida, uh, Ranking Member Webster, uh, that, that we that we need to pay attention to, and it's and it's not a coastal problem, but the um, the flood insurance issue. You know, it's set to expire in September, and uh, we continue to put a bandaid on that. And so I, I would say to this committee today too, and I sat on a, uh, a 
a roundtable discussion with Congressman Charlie Chris a few years ago, and we began to look for solutions to the flood insurance issue. And so I think hand in hand, I think the insurance members on the, this uh, uh, call today will also agree with me that uh, we need to quit putting a Band-Aid on flood insurance. And I'm not saying that because uh, I, I'm from Florida, because flood, floods are not a coastal issue. Thank you very much. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask a couple of questions myself. And this can go to anybody on the panel. We're trying to be the best stewards of taxpayer money, and we've reacted to a lot of this weather and that you've all mentioned by in creating a number of uh, disaster programs. You've got some in HUD, you've got some in uh, defense and transportation, DOE, EPA, just all these different programs. I wonder if you could tell to how we can make them more accountable, how they can be more cost effective, and how they can be more coordinated so you don't just keep creating layers of bureaucracy and difficulty for people who need to apply for these funds that come from different sources. I'd like to speak on behalf of the National Emergency Managers to that point, because that is um, that is an issue that we uh, are really are constantly up against. It's the numerous federal programs, uh, both before, during, and after disaster. And if there could be a, a way at the federal government level to centralize this coordination, and to us, it would really be FEMA needs to be well aware of all of the programs that are available within the federal government and to be able to coordinate with the states those programs and how they may be most effective per what that particular state's issue risk vulnerabilities might be. Um, that to us would be a great, great assistance. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I could add uh, perhaps a somewhat of, of a friendly amendment to Mr. Strickland's approach that we see that this is an issue and it is important to try to harmonize and allow the various programs to work together um, to have more flexibility on trying to match dollars from, you know, NRCS at USDA uh, with, with FEMA dollars for buyouts or something of that sort. But it, and I think allowing for projects that have co-benefits will be helpful. I'll go one step further. You know, there is uh, a national mitigation framework uh, developed seven years ago and it's been revised once. Uh, and in that they created a, a uh, mitigation framework leadership group. It has all of the federal uh, agencies on that group. In my prior role at FEMA, I got to lead that group. Um, it has the right people at the table. They have the right conversations. But to be honest with you, Madam Chair, there is not a mandate legally, there is not a mandate from Congress that tells those uh, individual programs with different departments and different committees of jurisdiction to make it simpler, to bring those efficiencies there. And so it's, it's done far too ad hoc, it's done too, far too much of it's informal um, because everyone's following their own uh, organic act, their own legal uh, framework. And uh, to Mr. Strickland's point, it just becomes unreasonable by the time you're trying to uh, implement it on the ground. Sometimes you get into jurisdictional battles among the agencies yeah. as well. Nobody wants to give up Absolutely. any turf or any budget. This is true. Sounds like from all of you that this might be something we need to look at more carefully and we'll welcome your wise counsel as we do that. One other question, we saw in FEMA's National Advisory Committee report that underserved communities stay underserved. They usually don't get the benefits of some of these programs. Uh, I wonder if y'all might comment on how we could better serve those communities, get the information to them, get the resources to them, supplement their ability to apply for grants. Any suggestions? <laughs> I think twofold. One of them is there is a need to develop, have the capabilities in the ground to develop the applications. But I think the bigger issue is um, the ability to bring the match. 
In almost every state, the locality has to bring that 25% match, uh, which is required in all of these, at least the FEMA grant programs um, that we're referencing here today. And underserved communities don't have that. And that was my point earlier. You know, while there were $3.6 billion worth of applications that came in from BRIC, I wonder how many of those are coming from underserved communities. How many of them really have that? So yeah, I'm always reticent to say that we should change um, cost shares all the way to 100%. Um, but I do think it's appropriate to look at that cost share and potentially make adjust adjustments specifically when underserved communities will increase their resilience. Well, we did that in the COVID rescue package, and so it is a possibility. Maybe we can maybe look at that and uh, shape it in such a way that it would be limited. A good suggestion. Excuse me, but somebody else was. I would. I, I would just suggest, Madam Chair, uh, that an example from the state of Florida might uh, be helpful, where they provide different amounts for. Uh, different localities share depending upon what kind of efforts have under have been undertaken and perhaps you could do that with a, a balancing sliding scale based on level of need thank you thank you very much uh, mr guest thank you madam chairman uh, mr harper uh, in your uh, testimony uh, you cite my state of mississippi uh, as an example that you use on page five uh, you say there on page five, it says, when considering resiliency, we need to consider the entire built environment. For example, if we provide business interruption insurance for a casino operated on the Mississippi coast built with hardened, resilient components, we need to also consider the supporting infrastructure that can have a direct impact to the insured. It does no good to have a resilient building that is fully capable of operating after a major winter impact but the roadways leading to the facility are damaged or impassable. This is just one example of why it is fundamental to consider the supporting infrastructure when building a complete resilient environment. Uh, Mr. Harper, can you speak on the importance of investigating, or excuse me, uh, on the importance of investing in resilient infrastructure okay. as a public good, which would then support private investment and do you believe that such investment would then incentivize private investment in resilient structures and new construction in those areas? Um, yes, sir. Uh, you know, speaking to the importance of infrastructure is also talking about the importance of response and recovery. We need to invest in infrastructure systems that can withstand disaster in order to allow emergency responders, at minimum, allow emergency, emergency responders in and to allow recovery to begin as soon as possible, opening up businesses within days and not weeks. Now, further, with more detail provided in my written testimony, is, as you stated, infrastructure is critical to economic resilience, which is really two parts. One is lessening the impact of the event, and two is the speed to the, the, to the time of recovery to normal. Um, and as an insurance provider, that's really our role, is to try, try to bring, make people whole and make people businesses once again. And that is two part. Um, and that's why it's so critical right now when you do look at, uh, at an asset to consider all parts of resiliency, which infrastructure is a critical part of that. Uh, with regards to the second part of your, your question, uh, I absolutely believe that investment in sound resilient infrastructure will incentivize private investment. Um, in particular, infrastructure performance is a key due diligence metric in analyzing commercial real estate investment. I mean, simply put, nobody wants to invest in a property with an above average chance to become a stranded asset. And even if, even if there's development in a non-investment market, um, companies want, a safe, uh, want safe access to and from their facility for both customers and employees. And that's why resilience has to be part of this. Uh, resilience in infrastructure has to be part of the conversation. And continuing kind of along that same vein, uh, in February, winter storms across the south devastated many local uh, water uh, and electric systems. Uh, Jackson, the capital city of Mississippi, a city that I am proud to represent, uh, parts of the city lost water for more than three weeks. And here we are now five weeks out and there are still portions of the city that do not have an adequate supply of clean drinking water. This has affected families, businesses, schools, all have been affected by this. Mr. Harper, you speak also uh, in your testimony 
uh, on page six, you say that we are at a crossroads with regard to aging infrastructure. Uh, that combined with significant increase in severe weather events, we can no longer afford to deploy temporary or band-aid fixes. Uh, and so my question to you is what fixes to our aging infrastructure can we make that will be most beneficial to the taxpayers? I, I think at this point, it's, uh, it can, it's not only what fixes can we make, but what replacements need to be made. If you look at a lot of the aging infrastructure, so much of it was built post-World War II. Uh, and with the, with the rapid growth in population in certain areas, that infrastructure, we continue to put Band-Aids on that. Uh, one example is uh, stormwater systems in this country, which, which the, if you look at the ASC score, scorecard, I believe received a D minus. That's just one example of the aging infrastructure that we not only need to look at it and say, hey, what can we do as a temporary fix? But, you know, has this reached the end of useful life and would we be, would we be better served if we put those funds uh, truly towards replacement? With an eye of, uh, with an eye for the future, recognizing that times have changed. We are living, uh, we we are living in an environment where the frequency and severity of storms is occurring at a much greater rate, and we need to plan accordingly for that. So, you know, there's that potential that our existing infrastructure, even with certain upgrades, may still be inadequate. So, so we really need to look at that with uh, with with an eye for what we expect to see in the coming years. Uh, thank you, sir. And Madam Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I particularly thank you for this hearing. It's about something that the Congress just seldom does, investing ahead of time in order to save money in the long run. My first question is for Mr. Falk. I was interested in your question on uh, your, your comments on housing affordability my district and many others like it find that young people, for example, are living in apartments, then for two, four, five are in that apartment. Uh, housing affordability is a major concern throughout the country. Residents who most need to modernize their uh, housing are the least likely to have the resources to do so. Uh, could I ask you, therefore, uh, what, how effective are tax incentives uh, for low-income communities who don't pay enough taxes to get a credit for home improvements and whether, what other resources are there for them to modernize their homes? So could I ask that, that two part? Well, I think, thank you. Thank you for the question. I think that it's important that there's financing opportunities for people in these areas. Uh, the older home stock in our country is the area that needs real attention, that needs construction to bring it up to be re being resilient. Um, affordability has become more and more difficult with regulations. Uh, 25 to 30 percent of a house before it's ever built, the cost of that house is is in regulations. And uh, there are people trying to make code changes out there that uh, are companies that are promoting a product and commerce. So we need to trust research and use good data to make our decisions. But the financing opportunities should be out there and available to these areas uh, that you're speaking of in your district. So that these older homes can be, the construction of those homes can be brought to date and, and have them be brought up to being more resilient. Yes, and I'm not sure how low income people are gonna be able to do so. I, I, I understand your answer. Uh, this question, my next question is, is for both Mr. Wright and Ms. Smith, uh, because you have focused on disadvantaged and low income uh, residents. Um, most, uh, the, the most vulnerable housing to face challenging upheavals in a disaster uh, will come, will, will make it difficult for low income and disadvantaged people. What ideas do you have for how Congress can focus resilience and mitigation 
on aid of some kind on those who are most vulnerable. That's for you, Mr. Wright, and Ms. Smith, a related question. You talk in your testimony about breaking silos to use infrastructure to deliver uh, benefits to communities. How can breaking silos benefit high poverty, uh, vulnerable communities? So those, the, the, those, that two-part question is for Mr. Wright and Ms. Smith. Well, th thank you, Ms. Martin. I, I think that there are a number of pieces that are here. So clearly, when people have the ability to pay for it, we need to nudge them to go do it. Sometimes those kind of tax incentives will help. Uh, but I do think some ideas like the community disaster resilience zones, literally putting ways by which um, it, private investment would be incentivized to go into those areas, you know, variations or maybe in a more targeted way towards um, opportunity zones. First of all, second of all, many of the times these people are renting, and this is a point where the HUD financing uh, is there for those multifamily dwellings. They may be a renter, but there is federal money that is backing those pieces up. So how do we make it a requirement at the point of construction and even an ongoing requirement that if you are getting support, capital or otherwise through HUD, you must be meeting these resilient standards so that those who live there um, can withstand the events. Uh, Ms. Smith? Yes, I would certainly uh, second what, what Mr. Wright has said, is that in many cases it is, is the rental housing that suffers significantly, and, and a lot of those folks are renting and don't even recognize that there is a, a flood risk, for example. Um, I'd go back to what Mr. Harper said. Some of the answer is a whole of community solution. Uh, you may be able to help the those who are least able to help themselves by having better stormwater infrastructure and having better protection uh, across the, the community, not just the housing itself. Um, I, my testimony points out one a, a, a really promising project by Enterprise Community Partners with, with Miami, uh, the city of Miami called Keep Safe Miami, where they're trying to work with uh, housing portfolio owners, so the multi-housing portfolio owners, so that they can improve those, those housing units and protect the people who are their renters. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Gonzalez Colon. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and the ranking member. And I was I was looking at the, the statements of all, all witnesses today, and of course, I, I think uh, my constituents have had uh, an intensive four years between hurricanes, earthquakes, and, and now the, the pandemic. And one thing is clear, and it, it is about not that those disasters are not coming to us, of but how fast we can recover uh, from from them, and 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 losing services, losing water, losing electricity, and in our case even telecom, uh, was something that we never experienced before. So there are some truths, uh, basics here. First, uh, another word, disasters are ne never going to stop happening, uh, and we need those mitigation uh, measures. Uh, so our infrastructure and housing businesses are, are prepared uh, to face them. And second, we cannot make infrastructure and buildings indestructible, even if, if we wish. Um, so that resiliency and the capacity to get back in function should be the one uh, that be measured. And, and it's not just fixing what, what's got broken uh, like it was before. Uh, every time, I think that that is wasteful, and uh, the proper mitigation and the resiliency measures in, in our times uh, should be to build back better. And I've been I've been preaching uh, that for the last four years because I think it's a taxpayer's expense and, and, and waste of money if we do not change uh, the new buildings and, and to the current codes. Uh, so in that sense, I, I, I work with Congress, Congressman Grace in, in the fight for the Disaster Recovery Reform Act, and I will continue to do and be by his, his side, seeking those provisions to be fully implemented. I think the critical services definition that uh, we've been uh, promoting in several bills, and I, I'm glad that one of the witnesses even brought uh, those issues, uh, but I think also advocating for uh, bring structures uh, to the current building and safety codes, regardless 
of the previous states uh, should be the measure for all areas that are being impacted by disasters. Uh, however, I, I must bring up that uh, uh, there, there's something uh, here that uh, we, we need to take, take care of as well, and, and it's the issue of, of the funding, and, and you just brought it. Um, I must point out that uh, from the information that I do have from FEMA, Puerto Rico received uh, $2.9 billion for mitigation, uh, risk mitigation assistance. Of those, only $108 million has been obligated. So it's not just that the money is being uh, approved by Congress, it's how fast or why people are stopping that money to, to being uh, obligated, and we, we must pay attention uh, for why, who is responsible, and, and what, what, what are the issues that are stopping that money from coming. So I will make one question right now to the Institute of, uh, for Reinsurance Association of America, um, and it's that I, I'm looking at the appendix uh, that you provided in terms of in, in your in your statement, and uh, I, I think it's good uh, to to know the, the census track about the national risk index and among other things. But I'm not seeing Puerto Rico there, so my question is: Are we included? And if not, why? Um, so thank you for the question. Uh, we included two illustrations uh, in this, uh, looking one in Florida and one in Nevada. And I'd be pleased to follow up with you uh, and look at some of the particulars uh, that are existing uh, that apply there. It's built off of national risk in inventory pieces from FEMA, as well as other private sector pieces. Uh, and uh, we'll work with your staff to make sure that you can get yours as well. Thank you. And one of the issues that has uh, is, is been one of the hurdles and, and obstacles back home in Puerto Rico is in order to get some FEMA funds to be obligated for public assistance uh, in many areas, you need those municipalities and the state to actually uh, look at their insurance. And we've been fighting for the last three years to get those insurance to, to, to get paid. Uh, some of them went, back, went into bankruptcy, uh, so it's been, it's, it's been a nightmare uh, for a lot of pr uh, private owners, including the government of Puerto Rico, just to make that uh, recover uh, those funds. And that is stopping many of the rest of the recovery process with uh, uh, government buildings and public infrastructure because we need to wait for that. Uh, and in that sense, uh, there's, there's a claim, at least in my district, I don't know if that's happening in the rest of the districts uh, here, um, how we can expedite uh, that, that process of reviewing, doing the assessment, uh, making the proper payments, uh, because once that's done, then you have FEMA, and then you have the local government doing the matchup uh, for, for, for many of those issues. Do you have any recommendation directly in that sense? Uh, you know, Ma'am, I, I think everything has to do with this particulars uh, of the claim that is in place, as is the case in Puerto Rico, as it is all across the United States. Uh, it is a state regulated uh, entity um, and on the insurance side of the equation. Uh, and oftentimes they're best positioned um, to lay in that space. And in some cases you're saying some of those providers may not uh, exist as they did formerly. I know my time is expired, Madam Chair, so I will submit some uh, questions for the record. I yield back. Well, we want to be sure that you follow up with the information on Puerto Rico, Ms. Gonzalez. We will do so. Right, thank you, Ms. Davids. Thank you. Then we'll go to Ms. Napolitano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's a great interest that I'm listening to this. Uh, one of the things we noted is that Mother Nature no longer is dependable. Uh, we have things that happen like the uh, cold in the, uh, Texas. and But in California, we have problems with earthquake, with fire, and with the levees out in Northern California, <clears throat> pardon me. But I have long been a proponent that below ground is where the utilities ought to go. But uh, uh, Mr. DeFrancio is right. We lost you, Grace. I don't know if it's at your end or at our end. You wanna try, try something? Something, some magic? We'll come, we'll come back to you, uh, Grace. 
Oh, sorry, this is Van Dan. Oh, yes, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Falk, I just want to ask you a question. You had suggested that we should take a comprehensive look at disaster preparedness and recovery. Would you mind elaborating on that? Uh, uh, would you repeat the question again? Sure, sure. You had, you had uh, suggested that we should take a look a comprehensive look at disaster preparedness and recovery. And I'm just wondering if you wouldn't mind elaborating on that. Well, I, I think if I if I spoke to that, it was in regards to the model that the state of Florida has been over the years, uh, responding to hurricanes, preparing for future hurricanes and, and, and uh, disasters that, that happen. Um, I, I'm proud to say that I, I, I'm a, a resident of Florida and a, and a home builder in Florida. And uh, it, some some of the requirements are, are have been difficult for uh, everyone to accomplish and adjust to, but uh, the fruits of our labor have proven, like I said earlier, in, in Mexico Beach, uh, the results that we saw from there. And um, but going forward, you know, the, the state of Florida um, has has done an outstanding job uh, being prepared for hurricanes and the response we have when a, when a natural disaster happens and str even strong winds uh, can cause a lot of disaster or, 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 or rain. So the state of Florida has done an outstanding job being prepared for this. Uh, and uh, I'm just proud to say that you know, we have done a lot of work and research towards that uh, goal. Well, no, I mean, I know you have. When I worked at uh, HUD, it's back in 2017, when we had Hurricane Harvey and we had Hurricane Maria. I'm sure you remember that. I think the initial um, um, estimates for damage in Florida was going to be over $5 billion and it ended up being less than, than half a billion. Um, and that was almost specifically exclusively due to the fact of the resiliency build. Um, and a lot of states did not have that, as Jennifer was pointing out, about uh, Puerto Rico. So I think we've definitely learned, learned our lessons on that. And we're very, very much in favor of anything that we can do because Puerto Rico is kind of a neighbor of ours and, and we've uh, been working very hard to do what we can to help Puerto Rico and the residents in Puerto Rico. But, uh, you know, to give you an example of, of construction and preparedness, though, uh, there's been a new uh, rule in Florida where you have your your code where this, the uh, house has to be built, for instance, 12.5 feet above sea level uh, to, to meet 100-year flood, flood plate requirements. And now they've just added an item called freeboarding, which adds another foot to that requirement. And the layman doesn't understand how one more foot adds, in some cases, five to ten thousand dollars to the cost of a house. So I, I keep going back to housing affordability. Yeah, uh, it's 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 of the utmost importance uh, for for everyone, every everybody that uh, that has the dream of owning a home in our country. Well, you you just kind of you just kind of teed me up, by the way, from for my my other question is, you know, there are some regulations or administrative burdens that increase the time it takes home builders to deliver projects and prevent innovation on resiliency. Um, you know, how can Congress address those and what kind of recommendations would you have? What are you seeing? Policymakers need to reduce regulations. <laughs> more, you want to be more specific? <laughs> I just got here. I just got here. I need to be more specific. <laughs> well, uh, next time I'm up in Washington, I'll have a class for you. Uh, <laughs> But uh, no, the the uh, it it it's uh in in Florida, you know, I guess we're the leaders in a lot of the things in the coastal construction because hurricanes are pr so prominent in our area. But uh, you know, it's it's in 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 uh, ranking member Webster. Uh, he was involved with our our uh, codes committees that that worked to to create these codes for hurricanes. Oh, I guess I was just asking, there was, do, you, do you see that some of the regulations basically prohibit kind of the innovations? On yeah, it, it does. It, 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 it takes time, especially in the land development side of it. Okay. Uh, in, in some areas, there, there are multiple layers of approvals. And so we've experienced that in Florida. And we're, as a state, we're trying to do some things to, to help eliminate some of the regulations. But some of it uh, is repetitive. And uh, and once you get past uh, one uh, 
layer of regulation, there's another layer for you that is redundant. It's, it's almost a similar request, uh, but just from a different office. And so uh, I mentioned earlier that 25 to 30 percent of the cost of a house right now is regulations. And in and, and majority of the regulations are attributed to the land development side of it. But uh, time is money. And uh, and under the circumstances now with COVID and a lot of the shortages of materials and things we're experiencing as an industry, uh, lumber prices, uh, affordability is becoming very, very difficult. And, uh, and, and we take this very seriously at the National Association of Home Builders. Excellent. Thank you very much. I yield back my time. Thank you. I believe Ms. Napolitano is back with us. Yes, I am. Can you hear me now? We can. So the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. My uh, 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 statement has been that maybe we need to look at what agencies um, deal with uh, hurricanes or any uh, kind of emergency and what they do with that uh, monies they get. I know that you say that they don't want to give up any kind of uh, uh, title or ownership but it would be nice to know what they do with anything they are given. Uh, the other thing I want to say is uh, we ignore the Native Americans and of course the territories as you have heard from Puerto Rico, the Mariana Islands uh, have suffered a lot of uh, uh, um, hurricanes. Uh, but uh, to Mr. Wright, the building codes in California are very extensive and very harsh. I know that, but we have earthquake, we have fires, and we have uh, levees up in Northern California. Uh, Mother Nature has thrown a lot of curves and will continue to uh, uh, give us heartache, I think. So how can we prepare for that? Uh, how do we uh, uh, amend our building codes? Because every area is different. You can't say that one applies to all of them. And uh, uh, any information that you can give, dissemination to the legal cities to the governors mm -hmm. to give to the city so they can can start looking at things that they should be looking out for in their own areas. Anybody? <laughs> Yeah, th thank you, Congresswoman. I, I, what I would uh, say to you is, first of all, I think California has um, has has really, really solid um, building codes. I think on the earthquake side, particularly, they're very good. Uh, they um, have good pieces on wildfire as well. But remember that most of the homes in California were built well before any of the wildfire um, building codes came into uh, to effect um, in that space. Um, as we move forward in that space, we've got to find a way, particularly in wildfire, to understand there's individual to the person. I'm away from my phone. Please. Uh, I'll keep going. Sorry. Uh, that there is the structure itself, but it's also the neighborhood and the surrounding community. And it really requires all three of those layers to take action. Wildfire is one of those few pieces that even if you perfectly mitigate your home, um, your neighbors not doing the right thing can cause your home to burn. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, and I have an area in my in my backyard that uh, we have a, a mountain range, and so we do have uh, the uh, ability of, of fires. We had several in the last uh, couple of years that have really been devastating. And then it, it deals with the sludge, the mud coming down off the mountains because later you get rains and then you get that uh, additional uh, burden for the residents. But yes, uh, the Bobcat fire this year that kind of set up a whole series of cascades um, there in your district. And then when the rains do come, that turns into mud and flooding. Uh, to Ms. Ms. Smith, uh, can you discuss the need for increased investment in water quality and some water projects? That's one of the areas that uh, uh, Chairman DeFazio, Mr. Fitzpatrick, and I introduced a reauthorization of the uh, Clean Water SRF program recently and includes a grant program. But can you uh, touch on that? Uh, be happy to. Um, as a former member of the Virginia State Water Control Board, I know how important those, those programs are to states and to localities. Um, and I do understand that, um, you know, it was maybe 10 years ago. Um, some of the leaders actually from California in the wastewater industry and the water utility industry 
we're calling it the era of assessment. So that uh, there's a lot of work going on assessing vulnerability. And I think to the extent that you, for the, for the utilities that haven't done the assessments, to getting that going in your infrastructure package, and also to adding money so that they will be able to start building in the protections to elevate their, their uh, mechanical components, their electric, uh, to protect, put up berms, to protect their intake points, protect groundwater supplies, all of that. If you can add that into your package, that would be greatly needed, I greatly appreciated, I think. Well, we'd appreciate any comments you have to forward to the committee or to me, committee staff or to my office, and we will look at them and see if, if we can uh, add them now. But uh, I certainly like to uh, thank everybody for being on here. It's interesting, uh, back uh, maybe 10 years ago, maybe more than that, I was looking at the insurance for the uh, riverbed, and uh, it, it, it opened my eyes to the fact that many people don't know because they're renters that have the housing and they don't hear about it and they don't get the insurance and they're, they're at risk. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, you know, one thing that hadn't been mentioned is all these projects, whether it's assessment or mitigation or construction, result in the creation of jobs. And that's another plus that comes from all of this. Now go to Mr. Graves. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Madam Chair, I wanna actually commend you for your, your statement and questions earlier about all of the different funding streams and resiliency programs across the federal government. I believe Mr. Wright to some degree covers it in his testimony as well. Um, as we all know in this committee, we have a, nearly $100 billion in backlog Corps of Engineer authorized projects. Uh, we put two to $3 billion a year into the construction of those. You do the math and you'll finish them approximately never. Um, in addition, we have the BRIC program, pre-disaster mitigation, hazard mitigation grant program, community development block grant, uh, disaster recovery, uh, you have NFIP's uh, ICC program, uh, federal highway program has an emergency program, um, the USDA, uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service, on and on and on. And, and the problem is, is all of these programs, they're, they're siloed. Now, Madam Chair, we worked with you, and, and I, again, want to thank Chairman DeFazio for uh, the, the work we did on at least knocking down one wall between uh, Corps of Engineer programs and the hazard mitigation grant programs. Hey, look, if somebody's got a great idea for mitigation or resiliency in their communities, we should be incentivizing them to commingle the dollars and get these projects done, not installing barriers um, to that. And I, I want to turn to Mr. Strickland. Mr. Strickland, did, would you like to, to, to share opinions or just uh, thoughts about the various funds of uh, federal funds that can be used potentially for mitigation or for uh, resiliency type investments, yet the programs uh, coming from federal agency, or in some cases, even the same agency, aren't allowed to be commingled, which therefore prohibits uh, completing projects. Do you think that's something we should be addressing? Uh, absolutely, and that's something our uh, association has been very interested in. And it really came to light, um, particularly with some of the disasters in North Carolina, where um, you know there's the the, the there's the pre-disaster mitigation money, and then there's also the post. Uh, disaster mitigation money, and then the opportunity for the uh, funding out of HUD with the community development block grant, and the challenge of trying to line those programs up so they can complement each other, and you know truly make a, a long-term dis uh, difference. Uh, what I would call uh, really, uh, you know, pushing forward the future of mitigation, making it transformational. Uh, I know North Carolina had some some real challenges with that and worked very heavily with uh, you all on that as well as at their state level. But we constantly run into that uh, where we have money. We have money from two or three different federal programs, uh, but we can't use that money to be part of the match to another program. Uh, then we'll run into situations where uh, the National Highway Administration has uh, coverage of the center of the roadway uh, after a disaster, but FEMA has the left and right of the roadway. 
it, uh, it's, it, it's it amazing. becomes very cumbersome and challenging to get through that. Thank you. And, and Madam Chair, look, I remind you, part of the dysfunction, or perhaps a lot of it, is our fault. I mean, the, in the Congress, the House Financial Services Committee has jurisdiction over the Community Development Block Grant Program. Candidly, I think that that really is something that is related to disasters and should be more so under this committee's jurisdiction. Um, but thank you, Mr. Strickland. Mr. Wright, um, I, I really enjoyed reading through your testimony. There are a lot of things in here uh, that, that I think are really uh, insightful based on your extensive experience with NFIP. Um, you, you um, actually, one, one thing I, I maybe disagree with, and I just want to ask you to clarify, you, you said that we should permanently authorize the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Program, and I wanted to understand, do you believe that that specific program should be reauthorized or should be permanently authorized, or do you believe that the long term, that a long term recovery program uh, should be should be uh, authorized? It, I think it is a long term um, recovery program. CWGDR being the one that Congress has been using. Uh, the principal reason to say it needs to be permanently authorized is right now it's a whole new program that starts up every single time. It can have very different rules. It would be better if there were some predictable pieces to CDBGDR. Thus, our recommendation that it have a permanent imprimatur from the authorizers as opposed to just getting filled up by the appropriators. Uh, thank you. And I, and I think that 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 objective is what we really should be focusing on. And just to remind the committee. Agreed. Uh, we worked with uh, Congresswoman Plaskett and introduced legislation that actually do a FEMA long-term recovery program within this committee's jurisdiction that would achieve the objectives. Uh, folks came and testified for this committee, and on average, it takes HUD seven years to hit the same outlays of percentages as the Economic Development Administration's disaster program that they hit. I think it was in uh, 12 months or 16 months, something like that. So mm -hmm. it, it further... Uh, uh, impacts the disaster victims. Madam Chair, thank you very much. Look forward to working with you on some of these issues and yield back. Uh, yeah, I think we have our work cut out for us, but we have some common goals here and I look forward to pursuing them with you, Mr. Graves. Uh, Ms. Davis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I'd actually love to follow up on uh, what Congressman Graves brought up um, a couple of minutes ago. You know, I represent Kansas's third district. Uh, we're pretty centrally located. We have uh, one of the largest intermodal hubs in the country, and we happen to also uh, have the confluence of the uh, Kansas and Missouri rivers. We are, um, unfortunately, have been, uh, studies have shown that we are, the Kansas City metro area is likely to be uh, one of the most impacted uh, uh, metropolitan areas because of uh, climate change. And um, I think the idea of how we uh, fund projects and uh, what we're doing around that is really important. And uh, Mr. Graves brought up some of the different funding uh, options. And at the close of the 116th Congress, the House and the Senate reached an agreement to establish a resilience result, resilience revolving loan fund that would uh, seed state level funds and would make 30 year low interest rate loans to communities for investments in resilience and mitigation projects. And that loan option is one that's worked well on water infrastructure. I'm curious, Mr. Strickland, from your perspective as a state leader on this, um, in this space, if you could provide the subcommittee with some um, of your thoughts on this uh, new funding option. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll be looking to Maryland for uh, ways to utilize this new option. Well, I appreciate that very much because actually Maryland has a bill in right now that would create a fund that we could utilize for building resilience and really through mitigation projects. Uh, several other states have done the same thing. And I think it's uh, in the cooperation between the state governments and the federal government with this project that we'll really be able to make some strong headway, particularly where we build these funds and we ultimately have some of the match requirements that are available for the other grant programs as we move forward. So we, we're hundred percent behind that. Thank you, Mr. Strickland. And uh, I don't know if anybody else wants to weigh in on uh, this new funding option. Uh, I would add from the Pew Charitable Trust that we certainly see a revolving loan fund concept as a, that construct can help 
build institutional capacity and knowledge that can be shared. So it, it's a it's a good approach. Um, we had uh, backed that specifically for flood, but think it makes sense to do it as well across the board. Um, uh, so we're very supportive. If I could, I'd go just one step farther down this line. I think as we look at the larger amounts of dollars that are available in a BRIC program or other kinds of recovery pieces, the ability to bring match will be a gap. If this revolving fund is put in place and adequately um, filled up, I think it really becomes a reservoir for people to be able to take actions far faster than they would be able to do if they were simply waiting. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, and I'll, I yield back. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists very much for your uh, information. Your uh, presentations have been very helpful. We'll want to pursue some of the things that we've talked about today and we'll look to you as a resource. Are there any other questions, Mr. Webster, any comments? Well, then in that case, I don't see any questions. So I, again, thank you all for participating. I'll ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that maybe have been submitted to them in writing or provide information that was requested uh, by the members during the hearing. I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by the members or the witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you again, and the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you.